Uh, hey, uh, what if I told you that the secret to experiencing a joy that defies expectations lies not in what you receive, but actually in what you give? What if I told you that the secret to a joy that defies all of life's expectations lies not in what you receive, but in what you give. You see, sometimes we buy crazy things like two chargers because we think that the V8 is going to bring us more joy than the V6 does. And we buy shoes and we buy homes and we buy timeshares and we buy all sorts of things because of the joy we think that it will bring. But the reality is echoed from the words of Jesus in Acts 20, verse 35, that says it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, we're entering a series today that we're calling The Blessed Life. Um, And as we enter that series, I, I I need to set some expectations with you real quick. I want you to stop. I kind of want you to pause, kind of clear your mind, and remove any preconceived notions that you have going into a series called The Blessed Life. Um, One of the first ones, even when we say something like, it's more blessed to give than to receive, we often correlate that with just money. Um, It's not, even in that verse, he talks about laboring and those types of things. Um, It is not just about money. It's about our time, our talents, our treasures, and so much more than that. But when we say things like the blessed life, I wanna tell you a couple of things I'm not saying as we're going into the blessed life. In a world where there are a lot of uh, prosperity gospel type of conversations and messages that go around regarding uh, generosity, I want you to know this. Um, We see people saying things like, your best life now, you give and do this and you'll have your best life now. Uh, Probably not the case, Um, could be, but that's not what is meant and seen out of the scriptures. Um, We see people saying things like, you give in order to receive. The more I give, the more I'll receive. Maybe not. Um, It might, uh, but I'm just like, maybe not. (laughs) And that's not what we see from the scriptures. Um, You'll be blessed when you give back to the church or other avenues and nonprofits and those types of things. It's like karma mentality, right? Nope. Um, You might, but it's probably not the blessing that the world makes you think about. Um, The blessing comes differently. It comes into a heart that receives joy because of a generous heart that God calls us to be generous in. Not in actually what you receive as a blessing, quote, unquote. It's not true in the way that we want it to mean or other people say that it would mean. That's not what we are talking about when we say something like the blessed life. Um, Some of you may be thinking, okay, we're talking about the blessed life, and you've already mentioned generosity. I'm trying church again for the first time, and here we go. This is all about tithing and what the church receives. Nope, not either. Is tithing a part of generosity in the scriptures? 100%. Is it all of what is talked about in generosity? Not even close. Is it something that we will handle in one of the weeks? Absolutely. I'm not going to tell you which one because it'd be an empty auditorium. But it's something that we talk about, but it's not all of what we're talking about. And I think I'll help overcome that mentality here in just a little bit. Um, Do me a favor, even in that regard, could you repeat a statement for me? I'd rather my pastor tell me what's true than what I want to hear. Okay, say it with me. I'd rather my pastor tell me what's true than what I want to hear. Okay, we're on the same page, and you said it, not me. So, so here we go. Um, and did you know that in the scriptures, there are more than 500 verses on prayer? That there are more than 500 verses that talk about living out our faith. There are more than 2,000 verses that deal with money and possessions. And so you said you wanted to hear what's true, <laughs> So we'll talk about what is true. Now, don't, again, get off guard. This is not a series on money and possessions. This is a series about identifying that we are blessed people, that we are blessed and therefore we also should have generous hearts. Last, when we say blessed life, here's what we mean. We mean a life that is grounded in the heart of generosity. That's what we're talking about. And here's what we mean when we say generosity. And generous, the definition of generous is this. It's a willingness to give, share, or provide more 
than what is typically expected or necessary. It involves a readiness to offer help, resources, or support without seeking something in return. A generous person is characterized by their kindness and also their genuine desire to make a positive impact on the lives of other people. That's a generous heart. Generosity is often associated with the spirit of selflessness and a willing to go beyond what is required so that we can uplift other people around us. We do this because we realize that we're blessed. And we realize that we're blessed because we see the example of Jesus Christ. If you look at the life of Jesus, he was willing to give his life. He was willing to share it so abundantly. He provided more than what was actually necessary. He readily helped, he offered resources and supported without seeking anything in return. The blessed life ultimately is a generous life and a generous life resembles that we know we have a blessed life. These two phrases are synonymous with one another, especially for the follower of Jesus in the room. And today, as we kick off this series, we're gonna talk about the foundation of a blessed life, and it has everything to do with our hearts. I might step on some toes, I might not, but this has everything to do with our hearts. And here's the truth that I want you to know as you walk out of the room today. I want you to know this. A heart fostered in generosity finds greater joy in giving than receiving. A heart fostered in generosity finds greater joy in giving than receiving. If you have a copy of the Bible, do me a favor and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 15. We're gonna be in Deuteronomy 15, looking at verses seven through 11. I'll kind of reference quickly verses 12 through 15 as well. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, um, you can scan one of those QR codes in front of you. If you scan that QR code, it'll take you right to a, a link tree is what it's called. And it says scripture reading. It'll bring up Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 15 for you in there as well. That's also, if you're new with us today and you wanna fill out a connect card for us, you can fill out a connect card there um, online or hardback uh, copy that is in front of you as well. That's how you can find out about the events and things that we have going on in the life of our church, like our annual meeting on July 23rd, like picnic in the park on the 21st, like our kids camp and other things that we have going on. But you can find out all things on that QR code as well. Hey, if you're new to the Bible, Deuteronomy is it's about this man named Moses. And Moses is addressing the Israelite people before they enter into a land that God promised them. Now, Moses is not going with them. That's another story for another day. But he's addressing these people and kind of giving this like farewell speech, if you will, this encouragement, this exhortation to them, to this new generation that actually is going to enter into a land promised by God. Chapters one through 11 of Deuteronomy really focus on the like, the record, the historical record and the recounting of God's faithfulness to the Israelite people over time and how they can be encouraged to trust in God's promises because of that. And then it shifts a little bit and where we lie in, in chapters kind of 12 through 26, it really gets into um, this specific giving of this next generation like specific instructions for religious, social, and moral life while they're in the promised land. And part of that, of what we're looking at today, includes them being a generous people to other people in need. So Deuteronomy chapter 15, let's read verses seven through 11 and then break down what it means for our blessed life today. It says this, if there is a poor person among you one of your brothers within any of your city gates in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Do me a favor, say the word hard-hearted. That kind of stings just a little bit. We don't wanna think about ourselves being hard-hearted and so saying it feels weird, but he says, man, don't be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Instead, you are to open your hand to him and freely loan him enough for whatever need he has. Say the word whatever. Did some study this week. In my study, I found out that whatever means whatever. <laughs> you get the picture as I say that often, right? 
There's no stipulations to what Moses is talking about to these Israelite people walking in for whatever need he has. And verse nine says, be careful that there isn't this wicked thought in your heart. The seventh year, the year of canceling debts is near and you are stingy towards your poor brother and give him nothing. He will cry out to the Lord against you and you will be guilty. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. This is like the year of Jubilee when they cancel debts in that way. It says in verse 10 though, give to him and don't have a stingy heart when you give. And because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and everything you do. Verse 11 says, there will never cease to be poor people in the land. That is why I am commanding you, open your hand willingly to your poor and needy brother in your land. Father, we love you. And we thank you for the generosity that we have experienced through your son, Jesus Christ, who freely gave to us who were undeserving, who in fact put him there on the cross that he gave his life for as a substitute for our sin, Lord. And as we recognize and realize the blessed life that we have, Lord, help us to also recognize that it means that we are a generous people, just as you are a generous God and you sent a generous son in Jesus Christ. Do a work that only you can. We love you, we praise you, and thank you. It's in your son's name that we pray, amen. So thinking about this passage, there's three ways that we can begin to foster this heart of generosity within our own lives. And the first way is this. Cultivating generosity calls for a mindset change. If we're gonna begin to cultivate generosity in our lives and in our hearts, it's gonna call for a mindset change. Moses speaks about this in verses seven through nine. He said, if there's the poor person, one of your brothers, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Instead, open your hand to him and freely loan him for whatever need he has. So don't be of this accord, be of this accord. To go from here to there is going to take a mindset shift, right? It's gonna take a mindset change in our lives. He says, be careful that there's not a wicked thought in your heart. And we'll talk about the canceling of debts in a moment. What God is saying through Moses here is that when it comes to generosity, our initial heart is one of hard-heartedness and selfishness. Can I ask you a question? Do you know that we're a stingy people? It's okay, just say amen if you know that we're a stingy people, right? I mean, there's songs written about it. I wanna talk about me, you wanna talk about my, if you're a country music fan. Um, I'm, I'm like not a fan, but not also not a fan. So I'm somewhere in between, but I've heard that song enough to know that it's too catchy and too true uh, for me to listen to. We're a stingy people. We hear things like, well, what's in it for me? Or what am I going to get out of this that I'm doing in a generous type of way? That's our first thought when we dive into components of generosity. And what God is saying is that we're gonna have to change that mentality. Moses is very clear. He says, don't be hard-hearted. Don't be tight-fisted towards our poor brother. Don't be stingy. Don't we say stingy just with our kids, right? When they're being stingy, we're like, oh, they're stingy, right? And like Moses is like, oh, you're stingy. <laughs> I'm like, man, these are grown adults. Yeah, we're stingy too. Then you have this aspect of this like seventh year statement here, which means that when people would get close to the seventh year because there was this canceling of debt in the seventh year, right? This kind of year of Jubilee type of mindset that was going on, they would cancel debts in the seventh year. So if somebody came up to you and said, hey, I need to borrow this, and they're in year six before year seven, the mindset of the people was like, well, we're a little bit too close to me freeing you up. I don't know if I can do this. Can you wait two years and I'll give it to you? Right, and then you can pay it back over the seven years before we get there. Moses is calling them out. He said, hey, that's wicked when you are thinking about we're too close to the seventh year. That's stingy. He says, instead, open your hands and freely loan whatever they need. What he's saying here is that generosity requires a move from this being self-centered to being compassionate. You gotta move from this self-centered mindset that we have to now a more compassionate heart that cares for other people if we're gonna move into generosity. He's telling the, the Israelites here to let go of the reluctancy and the hesitancy that they have when it comes to helping other people in need. He says to think about them. Church, that requires a transformation in our mindset. That requires a huge mindset change. We have to go from this personal gain mindset or this protection of my assets mindset and, and away from also this what's called a scarcity mindset. 
right? The scarcity mindset is one that has a fear of not having enough, and you only think in terms of a lack of what you have. So your mind is always going, I don't have these things. I don't have enough to do this. If only I had a little bit more, I could do this thing that maybe God is calling me to do. That's a scarcity mindset. You list all of the limitations on your life because of what you do not have. And it's not just money. It's time, it's talents, it's resources, it's ability, it's skill. We see this mindset come out in things like hoarding, right? When when people hoard, and and don't think of the like crazy TLC hoarding shows where you can't walk through the home, that's real. But I'm talking about like, you know the, the hoarders, like you walk in their house and it's like, how many more trinkets do you need, right? You're like, how many pictures from 1972, do they need to be up, you know, in this area or whatever it is. And so they hoard and they just keep everything. It's like, how many pairs of Jordans do you need, Chris? (laughs) It's not hoarding. It's joy. No, I'm just kidding. And so like this hoarding aspect says, I've got to keep and hold on to everything. I need to hold on to these things because I may never have another time where I get to have them back again. I may not have another opportunity to get this thing, or I may not have another opportunity to have this emotion that this thing brings to me. And so I need to have it. So I keep it in. How about another one that may hit a little bit harder? We see it in comparison when we feel envious or resentful of other people's possessions that we do not have. They're driving the V8 all-wheel drive Dodge Charger that I don't have. They're living in the home that I wish I had. They're going on the date nights that I wish I could go on. That's a scarcity mentality that says I can't do certain things because of lack of what I have. We also see this in a lack of generosity and we don't have a generous heart or a generous life because we believe that if we're generous or too generous, it's gonna diminish our own resources. And so we don't give in the way that maybe God would call us to, in the way that maybe Jesus reminded us that it's better to give than to receive. And by the way, all of this goes against what we see in the scriptures. Theologian George Mueller said it best in this way. He said, true joy comes not in possessing much, but in having much to give. You see that mindset change? It's not in about my possessions. It's not in possessing much, but it's knowing that my possessions are enough for me to give. I have more so that I can give. Not have more so that I can have true life, but I have more so that I can give. True joy comes not in possessing much, but having much to give. We have to shift from a mindset that says we don't have anything to one that says we have much to give and focuses on compassion and empathy and the well-being of others. Do me a favor, we've done this example a couple of times, but it works very well with this. Take your hands and like squeeze them. And as you're squeezing these hands, I want you to think of your possessions, your time, your talents, your treasures, your resources, and the things that you have. And I want you to squeeze harder and I want you to continue to squeeze as hard as you can. And you're just holding on for dear life for these things that you have that are yours, that you deserve to have. It's your right to hang on to them. You may never experience them again. And then I want you to just slowly let go. I don't know about you, but if I lived my life walking around like this, holding on, that's a lot harder to do than simply the beauty and the joy it feels to let go of that. I mean, like, it'd be weird to walk around like this, right? Like, you'd be like, what's up, Chris? What happened? Rough day? You know, who are you getting ready to do? We need to keep you away from people, um, you know? And, and so you're like, walk, you don't wanna do that. You wanna walk open-handed. Church, what mindset changes do you need to cultivate in your mind? Do you feel like you have nothing, therefore you need more? Or do you recognize that you have an abundance and you can be a blessing and give back? If we're gonna have a heart of generosity, we need to cultivate generosity by calling for a mindset change in our life. Secondly, we have to embrace, embracing generosity echoes a blessed existence. When we embrace generosity, it echoes a blessed existence that we have, right? In verse 10, it alludes to this a little bit. It says, give to him and don't have a stingy heart when you give. And because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and everything that you do, that you can have a blessing, that you will be blessed. Can I tell you, church, do you know that you're better off than you deserve? You can really say yes, sir. Do you know that you're better off than you deserve? 
I, when I was in medical sales, this is gonna age me just a little bit. This is before the time of Bluetooth and cars when you can listen to any Spotify playlist and podcast you wanted to. You actually had to listen to the radio or you had to have enough money to pay for a, an uh, XM radio subscription that felt like it was $8 million a year at that time, right? And you had to have a car that had the ability or you had to have like a, an actual little device that you put in your car that played the XM. I know it's wild for all of you that are a little bit younger than me, actually a lot younger than me. And, um, and so I would listen to Dave Ramsey a ton. And um, one of the things I loved about Dave Ramsey, that could go in several different directions, but one of the things I love in Dave Ramsey was that when somebody called into his show, they were like, hey, Dave, how are you? And he always said, better than I deserve. And I just thought, man, what a great heart to have. He realizes that he's blessed because he always said, I'm better than I deserve. I, I quoted the song a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's Adam Pelham who led prayer with us today. It's his favorite song. And that song says, on my best day, my worst day, some Tuesday or your birthday, every day's a good day. You have air in your lungs. You got blood in your body. You're a child of God. Come on and sing somebody. When we realize that we're children of God, that we have an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when we realize what he did with his death and his burial and his resurrection on the cross, for the sin that put him there from us. And he did it in spite of that. When we realize that, we realize that we're a blessed people. We don't deserve anything that God has given us. We have heartbeats in our chest. We are so blessed. For the follower of Jesus in the room, we have to realize a blessed existence means that we have it better than we deserve. Um, do me a favor, does anybody in the room have a $100 bill that they can come up and just give me a $100 bill? Just come up here right now and give it to me. Oh, okay, all right, Joel? I don't know what y'all are doing in the Abara house. Look, dad is like mad, okay. You see, here's the thing. The follower of Jesus understands that they are blessed more than they can possibly imagine. The follower of Jesus realizes that we deserve death that put Jesus on the cross. The follower of Jesus realized that Christ took our place with what we deserved on the cross. He took our sin that put him there. And because of his death and his burial and his resurrection, we have the opportunity to have an eternity spent with him. That's a blessed life, church. That's recognizing the blessing that we have. Now here's what you're all thinking. Why in the world did you just steal $100 from that kid? <laughs> and how did he have it so readily to walk up there? See, before I got up here this morning, I went over to him and I said, here's $100. When I ask for it in the middle of the service, I want you to come and give it to me with no questions, very confidently just walk up and give it. Do you know why it was easy for him to come up here and give me that? Because he realized it wasn't his. And did you know that the air in our lungs and the breath that we breathe and the skills and the talents and the treasures and the resources that we have are not ours, but they're 100% God's. And it should be easy for us to get up and give of those generously when he asks us to do it. It's so much easier to live a generous life when we realize that the life that we have is not our own, but it's the one that we have because Jesus died on the cross for us and that God created us in his image. That's recognizing a blessed existence. Church, do you realize how blessed you have it? Cultivating generosity calls for a mindset change. Embracing generosity echoes a blessed existence. And last but certainly not least, practicing generosity produces positive transformation. Positive transformation. Look what he says in verse 11. In verse 11, he says, there will never cease to be poor people in the land. That's why I'm commanding you, open your hand willingly to your poor and needy brother in the land. And then really in verses 12 through 15, it kind of mentions this as well. I'm just gonna read it. It won't be on the screen, but it says, if your fellow Hebrew, a man or woman is sold to you and serves you six years, you must set him free in the seventh year. When you set him free, do not send him away empty-handed. Verse 14 says, give generously to him from your flock, your threshing floor and your wine press. You are to give him whatever, there you go, the Lord your God blessed you with. Verse 15, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I am giving you this command today. Don't you think that those people set free 
in that seventh year were transformed and changed by the generosity that they experienced? Don't you know that you too at one point upon hearing and receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ and giving your life to him were transformed prayerfully, Lord willing, by what you received from what you didn't deserve to have, from the generosity of someone else. You should be transformed. Your life should never be the same. You should never be the same upon receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't you know that they were transformed when the generosity was practiced in and throughout the land? You see, we practice generosity because we remember the generous work of Jesus Christ and how our lives have been transformed because of it. The same way that we were transformed is the ability that we have to see transformation in the life of other people. Guess what, church? The gospel came to us on its way to someone else. And we get a chance to see that transformation. A couple of weeks ago, I asked on social media, somebody tell me the, the most generous thing that someone did to you or for you. And it was awesome to read all of these stories of what happened in the lives of a lot of people. And, and, and man, there were like homes that down payments were paid for or mortgages were paid for or cars were given to and all of this type of stuff. And, and what I remember though, more specifically in all of those was there was a common thread of the people saying, I'll never forget that. That changed us. We needed it. Don't you know that those people were transformed when they saw the generosity of others being practiced in everyday life? Reformer Martin Luther said this, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. Church, you have the ability within you, with your time, with your talents, with your treasures, and with your resources to transform the lives of this city. Even more, you get to remind them that you are doing it because of Jesus Christ and the generosity that he displayed. You want to have his heart and not your own. You're able to do that. When we moved to Denver, we were broke church planters and trying to figure out how in the world we were gonna start a church and raise money and pay for kids and stuff and eat and everything else. And during that time, we didn't have insurance um, because that's like the smart thing to do with four kids. Um, no, it's the broke thing to do with four kids. And so we didn't have insurance and Rhett had to have a surgery. Um, and man, Libby and I were like distraught as to how we were gonna pay for this and how we were gonna go through and walk through it. And one of our uh, partner churches that helped launch us the same way that we do uh, Rock City up in Thornton, the same way that last year we sent out uh, the local church in Arvada, um, one of our partner churches in Dallas, Texas, Lake Point Church, um, they always asked for like prayer requests. And then in prayer requests, I was just telling them, Rhett is when I have a surgery, would you please pray that everything goes well there? Um, and I didn't like share with them anything else. And in the next day, I got an email from someone on their team and they said, hey, um, how much is this going to cost you all um, for this surgery? And I was like, I, so I'm like a prideful, sinful man, right? Like it's like, I'm gonna like ruin the opportunity for other people to bless because I'm like, I'm a man, I can do this. I'm not letting anybody else know, you know, that we have a need. And so like after a couple of days when Libby was like, you better tell them exactly how much it's gonna cost. Um, and, and just because they're asking and they're one of our partners and all this kind of stuff, they sent a check to pay for his entire surgery. I'll never forget that. Like I was like distraught to how God was gonna do this and how we were gonna do this. And God was going, I got you all the time. Why? Because a generous church realized that they were more blessed and that it was more blessed to give than to receive. I desire nothing more that our church be one of the most generous churches anybody knows, that we were able to give, that we were able to bless, that we were able to give away, that we were able to serve in our community, that we were able to love on people that are in dire need because they're out there and they are all around. I will never forget that. That's the church that I want us to be. More importantly, that's the church that God wants us to be. It's all throughout the scriptures. A heart focused in generosity finds greater joy in giving than receiving. And why? Because we see the ultimate, ultimate generous moment of giving it all with the person and work of Jesus Christ. What we did not deserve, he gave away so freely so that we can have a right relationship with him forever in heaven. Church, what is holding back your heart from being fostered in generosity? What is holding it back? There's something that is holding it back. What is holding back your heart from being fostered in generosity? I love 
this quote. I want you to think about that in just a minute as we go into worship. But I love this quote also from Clementine Churchill, the wife of Winston Churchill. It says this, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So I wanna do something a little bit differently as we end today and our worship team gets ready to come back up here and lead us in a final song of worship. Um, What we're going to do, I have these buckets and in these buckets are envelopes and the envelopes in these buckets contain $20 bills and a card. And here's what the card reads. Someone wanted to show you that they were for you by paying for your meal or drink. Jesus was the greatest example of someone who was for others with no strings attached. He died on the cross to pay for the sins that were not his own. They were yours and mine. The person who gave you this card has experienced him being for them and is passing it on for you. It has riversidedenver.com at the bottom of it. So I also wanted to overcome your thoughts about, hey, this is just another message to get, 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 right, for the church. Oh, the church, they always talk about money. It's simply not true. You can go back and listen to any messages. It's not what we talk about all the time, but it is something that Jesus talks about. And so during this last worship song, as our team comes up, here's what I want you to do. I want um, one, this is per family unit. I want you to come up here and grab an envelope. We have some in the back as well for seniors that don't wanna walk all the way down. Um, But I want you, one per family unit, to come up and grab an envelope. And as you grab that envelope, I want you to know three things with them this week. Here's what my prayer is. One, you will be Holy Spirit led as you pray, seek, and ask God who you can give this to. I think the best thing that we can do is give it to who God wants us to give it to. And in order for us to do that, we have to be Holy Spirit led. We get a chance to step into the work that God is already doing. Like he's waiting for us to say, Lord, lead me, guide me, direct me, and show me who I can bless today, who I can be generous with today so that they may have an opportunity to know who you are. The second thing is, is this is going to practice generosity. That's my third point, right? Practicing generosity produces positive transformation. Sometimes generosity is like a muscle that we need to work and we gotta practice it and work it out. And so I want to get you into the vein of going and practicing generosity with other people. And then the third thing is this. We live in a day and age where a lot of people don't know how to get into a conversation with anyone, don't know how to engage with someone. While 95% of our city is spiritually disconnected from Christ and dying, going and spending a Christless eternity. And my hope and prayer is that as you engage in your neighborhood, your favorite coffee shop, your favorite restaurant, your favorite Target or Walmart or Walgreens or wherever it is, and you wanna practice generosity, that this allows you to have a conversation with someone about the person and work of Jesus Christ or even what he has done in your life. Now, we have this card in there, but my hope is not that you just do that and don't say anything to them, but maybe they're behind you in line and you say, hey, I want to pay for your drink. And I'm gonna do that because I'm for you. And I'm for you because there's a God in heaven that is for you and I have experienced that same loving kindness. And so let me pay your drink and then you can give them the card to let them know. If we want to be living the blessed life, we have to also live the generous life. A heart of generous, fostered in generosity finds greater joy in giving than receiving, or maybe the words of Jesus are even better. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So as we play this worship song after I pray, I want you to walk forward, one per family unit, and just grab an envelope. Take it, it's yours, there's no we're not checking up. You don't turn, turn in your notice or receipts or anything like that. I want you to take this and live a generous life this week with someone and I want you to watch God work.
Father, we love you and thank you that, Lord, you gave your only son in the most generous way possible. Lord, he died a death he did not deserve to die, was put on a cross he did not deserve to be on and resurrected on the third day to sit at your right hand to intercede for us. And your scriptures are very clear that if we believe in his death, his burial and resurrection, if we ask him to forgive us of our sin, he's so generous to forgive us. And if we ask him to lead our life, then we have a right relationship with you forever in heaven. That's the best example of generosity we can see, Lord, and that shows the blessed life that we have and the blessed life that we're able to live. And so, Father, I pray that we would foster a heart of generosity, recognizing the blessed life that you have given us. I pray, God, that we would be a generous church to help others in need, Lord. Do a work that only you can. Father, and do the work not so that we can receive honor or glory, not so that Riverside can receive honor and glory, Lord, but so that you and your name alone can receive all the honor, glory, and praise. Father, I pray for the follower of Jesus in the room that they would remember the generous work of Jesus Christ that they have said yes to. And Lord, I pray that if there is anyone here that has never experienced that generosity, God, today would be that day that for the very first time they would believe and ask you to leave. Lord, do what only you can. I pray for these envelopes. I pray for the resources that are in them. God, I pray that there would be multitudes of people that would just catch a glimpse, God, of your love for them. That this city would be changed because of the generous life of people that you've called to live here in Denver and to be catalysts for multiplication in Denver, the West, and the world. Do what only you can through the mighty and matchless name of your son that we pray all of this. And all God's people said, amen.